Assalamualaikum and good morning everyone. Um, I welcome you all to the Pediatrics Grand Round on behalf of the Office of Academics Maruf International Hospital. I am Dr. Shamayel Anwar and I'm going to be facilitating today's session. Um, a little um, bit about the ground rules. Um, I just quickly go through the ground rules. Um, so um, we're going to have a 20, 30 to 40 minutes time for the talk. And after that, we're going to open the session up for question and answers. Um, for those joining us remotely, uh, I just request you all to please keep your mics muted and video cameras off. If you have questions, you can just um, write it down in the Q&A box, or you can just raise up your hands uh, once the talk is over. And we'd be happy to answer your questions. Um, so um, uh, it's a great privilege to introduce to you um, our speaker and a wonderful um, addition to our team of doctors, Dr. Shazia Iram. Dr. Shazia Iram is uh, a consultant, neonatologist, and pediatrician who's recently joined us. She has previously been working. Sorry, she's previously been working in Abu Dhabi. She's a um, fellow College of Physicians and Surgeons Pakistan and a member of Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health UK. Um, so Tokshazi is going to talk to us about a really important topic, uh, the management of acute exacerbation of asthma in children. Um, asthma, a condition uh, which is still um, a cause of a lot, uh, increased morbidity and mortality amongst children across the globe. So I'm sure we're going to learn a lot from today's session. And without wasting any more time, I'm just going to request you all to please welcome Dr. Shazia to the podium. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, so I'll talk about as, uh, today about the management of acute exacerbation of asthma. I chose this topic because uh, winters are coming and uh, a bulk most uh, bulk of the pediatric uh, population attending ER is because of the asthma exacerbations. Asthma is a huge topic. It's not possible to discuss it in one presentation. So my focus mostly is on the ER management of acute asthma exacerbations. So just uh, briefly, a definition. What is asthma? So what is asthma? <clears throat> And so asthma is defined as increased responsiveness of airways to a various stimuli, which re results in airway obstruction. This airway obstruction is reversible, either uh, spontaneously or with treatment. It is characterized by the recurrent attacks of breathlessness in bees. Now, acute asthma is presence of active symptoms of airway obstruction and or inflammation, and chronic asthma is absence of extended periods of periods free of symptoms without treatment. This is just a basic definition. Now, why asthma is important? Now, asthma is one of the most common chronic conditions worldwide. It affects more than 300 million people worldwide. It causes 255,000 premature deaths, that is preventable deaths. It's ranked among 16th among the leading causes of years lived with disability and 28th among the leading causes of burden of disease. Prevalence is expected to increase by 20% in the next 10 years. It occurs in all countries is irrespective of their level of development, but 80% of asthma-related deaths occur in low or middle-income countries, obviously because of the obvious causes. Now, this is a chart of prevalence of asthma worldwide, and if you look at um, Pakistan, it is green, and it, it shows here that 2.5 to 5 percent of the population suffers from asthma. <clears throat> Although uh, the prevalence of asthma in children is much higher compared to adults, or the mor mortality is much less. Now, according to a survey carried out in Karachi, 20 percent of pediatric population of Pakistan suffers from uh, asthma. There are lots of contributing factors. First of all, the big population size, the increasing trend of urbanization, poor health facilities, lack of knowledge, increased pollutant exposure and consanguous marriages. On top, people, a lack of education leads to poor compliance, non-affordability of medications, lack of follow-ups, and incorrect perception of the use of inhalers. Um, what, what, pathophysiology is simple. 
It is a narrowing of airways due to constriction of muscles, edema of the lining, and increased mucus production. The <clears throat> narrowing leads to area obstruction, and if this area obstruction is very severe, it can lead to fatality. The triggers in children, the most common trigger in children is viral illnesses. Um, the rest are the same, smoke, exercise, house test, mice, pet tender, pollen, change of weather, cockroaches, which are plenty in Islamabad. Now, what to do if a child, uh, now, we will now, from now on, discuss what to do if a child presents to ER with an acute asthma exacerbation. First of all, before we go on to the management, we know we, sh uh, we should be able to um, assess how will we assess the severity of um, exacerbation. Now, there's different um, ways of assessing the severity. This is uh, from BTS, British Thoracic Society. They have divided into moderate, acute, severe, and life-threatening. Um, milder cases are usually managed out of the ER, so that is a um, while. And the things they take into a consideration are three. One is the oxygen saturation, the other is the work of breathing, third is the peak expiratory flows. So if your saturations are fine, that is more than 92%, if there is no major sign of respiratory distress, and if your peak expiratory flow is more than 50% of predicted, you are moderate. If you have a saturations less, uh, less than 92 with the use of accessory muscles and some signs of respiratory distress and peak expiratory flow of 33 to 50, it is um, acute severe. And life threatening is obviously you present with low sacs, silent chest, agitation, confusion, cyanosis, and peak expiratory flows of less than 33%. Another way of uh, scoring is uh, by pulmonary index score. It takes into account the same parameters, um, but the only difference is peak expiratory flow is not uh, taken into account. So again, the respiratory rate, wheezing ratio, inspiratory expiratory ratio, accessory muscle use, and oxygen saturations. You score each of these from zero to three. You um, add up the scores, and if it is less than seven, it is mild. If seven to 11, it is moderate. And if it's more than 12, it is uh, severe. In actual practice, it's quite obvious when the child comes to you and you had a few exposure with dealing children with very small, moderate and spin. You don't actually need these goals, but, but these are available for your reference if you uh, need help. So what are the goals of management? The goals of management of asthma are very simple. You need a rapid reversal of airway obstruction. You want to correct the hypoxia. And the, if there is hypercapnia and you want to reduction of the likelihood of hospitalization and recurrence after discharge. Now, what are the elements? Again, asthma is only a few things you can do in asthma. So there are bone bronchodilators, systemic steroids, and supportive care, oxygen fluids. Hypoxia in asthma occurs from a ventilation perfusion and mismatch. And once if uh, you start bronchodilators in very severe exacerbations, the bronchodilators may even worsen your hypoxia because they lead to pulmonary vasodilatation in areas which are poorly ventilated. So administration of oxygen is very important in all children who present to ER with saturations of less than 92%. If we are giving liberalized medications, it's important that all of these are driven by oxygen and which is about six to eight liters per minute. Hypercapnia, hypercapnia will resolve on its own once the bronchodilator, um, bronchoconstriction is reversed. So management of bronchospasm. We will go through each and every medication that is used for treating bronchospasm first, and then we will go through the algorithms of when to use which one. So the cornerstone of managing um, uh, uh, bronchospasm is beta, short-acting beta agonists. Now, the, obviously, the most commonly used is salbutamol. It's called salbutamol here, called albuterol in, in some countries. But it's the same thing. What happened? This is it. So it is a standard of treatment for acute asthma exacerbations. Now, in 1980s, there were some trials done which showed that um, um, nebulized albutamol was as effective as subcutaneous epinephrine. 
um, uh, in treating acute asthma exacerbations. Um, and with regard to hospital admission, return to ED after discharge, admission and clinical score, vital signs, pulmonary function improvements. Subsequently, all the uh, studies have focused on the root and dosing of um, uh, beta-2 agonists. It's not possible, ethically possible, to compare it with the placebo. Now, uh, just to, to clarify the difference between albuterol, salbutamol, and levet albuterol, although uh, levet albuterol is never used in children. Now, albuterol is a combination of um, two polymers, the R albuterol, which is a bronchodilator, and S albuterol, which is weak um, bronchoconstrictor. Level albuterol, that is a pure R albuterol and a pure vasodilator. Theoretically, level albuterol should work better. But actually, in children, the studies have shown conflicting results and it has no benefit over albuterol. So, for practical purposes in us, all we only use albuterol in, in, in children unless they have a known adverse effect from it. Now, I guess that whether the most important thing is what should be the root of using um, uh, beta-2 agonists. Now, I, I don't know whether this applies to Pakistan because here I think the nebulizers are rampant and nobody uses inhalers, which is, which is a shame because it's, um, if you look at the uh, evidence, there's a lot of trials in meta-analysis which have shown that actually inhalers work as well as nebulizers in moderate, in even some cases of severe um, uh, asthma. There are obviously some shortcomings. Now, inhaler needs, uh, for inhaler to be used in children, it cannot be used without a spacer because children cannot coordinate the use of um, um, uh, a meter dose inhaler with a mouthpiece because it requires breathing in, holding the breath for 10 seconds, all that is not possible for children. So you need to use a spacer. The idea is that you put the puff in the spacer, it stays in the spacer, the child takes breathing in and out for five to 10 seconds, either through a mouthpiece or through a face mask, depending on their age. And the medication is goes into the lungs and is not deposited in the um, mouth and it is um, uh, much more effective way. Now, the downside of using inhaler and acute exacerbation is that if you need, you're needing very frequent um, uh, dosing, then it becomes cumbersome for a child who's already in distress. And also, if you're needing oxygen, then there's no point in giving inhalers because nebulizers are driven by oxygen. And then for inhalers, you'll have to stop oxygen delivery to give them. Um, Another uh, um, advantage of nebulizers is that if you need more than one medication, then the both of them can nebulize medication. Both of them can be delivered um, uh, via the at the same time via nebulizer. Now, what dose? Uh, uh, if we are using inhalers, so what used dose to be given in exacerbations? So, according to British Thoracic Society, if it's a mild exacerbation, you can use two to four puffs. Um, but if it is moderate to severe, then 10 puffs should be used. Uh, and obviously, you repeat them depending on the um, severity, which we will discuss uh, later. Uh, according to the National Asthma Education and Prevention Program, this is American. This is they use four to twelve parts, and more or less the things they are both uh, the doses are similar. And if you see, it's not per kilo based. The reason is that you give greater doses to smaller children because they are the least effective users. So. Um, and then, then the question comes, if you're using nebulized salbutamol, which is used most of the time in acute exacerbations, and most of the time if you come, the child comes in moderate to severe, you need to give back-to-back -back nebulizers, then the idea is whether you should give them every 20 minutes or you should give them continuously in one hour. Now, if you look at the evidence, there is no evidence to support that either one of them is better. The only advantage of continuously um, continuous levelizer therapy in the first hour would be that you know the staff won't have to come back again and again to refill, and if somebody gets busy, then you know the duration between the two 
therapies will be delayed. So it is less labor intensive and obviously ensures the goal of treatment, which is at least three um, doses within the first hour. Um, now, the dose of a nebulized salbutamol, um, the, it is standard, um, 0.15 milligram per kg. The minimum dose you should give is 2.5 milligrams, and the maximum dose you should give is 5 milligrams. So if a child is less than 5, you can use 2.5 milligrams. If more than 5 can, um, years, you can use 5 milligrams. Um, it's given every 20 to 30 minutes. Um, and uh, if you ask after the first hour, we, the aim is to give at least three doses. If you're needing even more after that, you can continue it every 30 to 40 minutes, to provide it and they don't develop the side effects. Most common side effects are tachycardia, tremors, and hypertension. And it is important to maximize the drug delivery. You dilute it into three to four milliliters uh, and give it with oxygen flow rates of six to eight liters. Now, for continuous, it is no standard um, as such a dosing system, but various institutes use different. I've used one, which I could found this is uh, that if you have a child of 5 to 10 kilos, you give 7.5 milligrams per hour. If you have a 10 to 20 kilogram child, you give 11.2 milligram per hour. And if it's more than 20, 50, 15 milligrams per hour. Then another bronchodilator is a, pro, a protropium bromide that is used widely in children. It is an ex, inexpensive, it's a safe anticholinergic agent that provides bronchodilatation through smooth muscle relaxation. And uh, ipratropium bromide in combination with beta agonist is recommended in treating children with moderate to severe asthma exacerbations. There's lots of trials uh, which have shown that uh, when these two are used together, and they reduce hospital admissions and improve lung function in children. Now, um, according to the BTS, if, if the symptoms of um, asthma are after use of beta to agonist treatment are persisting, then you add ipratropium bromide to the salbutamol um, uh, uh, and give it every 20 minutes for the first hour. And if you need to use it after the first hour, you give it every four hours. The dose is 250 micrograms for less than 20 kgs and uh, 500 micrograms per dose for more than 20 kgs. Mm, actually, uh, in acute exacerbation, there is no role of using uh, inhaled ipratropium bromide because it becomes cumbersome that you're giving two inhalers to a child who's already in distress. But if you have to use uh, it through a meter dose inhaler, um, the dose of uh, ipratropium bromide is uh, four to eight bucks, and there is 18 micrograms in each box. The next bronchodilator that which is used in um, asthma exacerbations is uh, widely used is magnesium sulfate. Now, IV magnesium sulfate causes relaxation of bronchial muscles, smooth muscle. It is again inexpensive, has minimal side effects, and is widely available. Uh, and there is um, uh, increasing evidence that uh, it can provide additional bronchodilatation when given in conjunction with standard bronchodilator agents in corticosteroids. Mm, this meta-analysis of five studies with 182 children found that it was effective in preventing hospitalization children warded to severe asthma when added to bronchodilators and glucocorticoids. It should be used in children with severe asthma exacerbation and in children with moderate asthma exacerbations who have not responded to initial treatment with beta-2 agonist, ipratropium bromide, and systemic glucocorticoids. <clears throat> The dosing, it can be is up to 75 milligram per kg, maximum two grams. Um, again, those for children who have not responded to the initial treatments, given intravenously over 20 minutes, it's, it is good to give a bolus with it because uh, of fluid, because it's going to cause sometimes hypertension. Um, it should be used with caution in kidney failure and um, uh, the, there were trials done on whether inhaled magnesium sulfate, um, uh, nebulized magnesium sulfate is effective, but they, uh, they didn't uh, demonstrate any clinically demonstrable benefits. Now um, we come to parenteral bronchodilators. So the parenteral bronchodilator is IV salbutamol. 
Um, and it is again there is evidence that if given your child is already on or um, and he, and nebulized bronchodilator is not responding and on glucocorticoids and is magnesium and sulfate and not responding, then they, that IV salbutamol offers some benefit. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. um, so again, there is some the evidence there. So, but it's important the RV salbutamol should be reserved for use with acute se severe asthma patients, and it should be and the children who are on IV salbutamol should be managed in H2 and ICU setting. The doses, it's important to give a bolus 15 mics per kg and then to continue infusion at the rate of one to three, five milligram per kg per minute. Hypokalemia is a common side effect, and other drug toxicities include dysarrhythmias, hypertension, myocardial ischemia, seen usually with higher doses. Now, IV salbutamol versus aminopyl. I don't know, I've not worked in Pakistan for a long time, whether aminopyl and before it used to be used widely. I don't know if it's still being used widely, but it is rarely used in outside, uh, in the Western countries because of its associated side effects. And this, this is a Cochrane review published in 2012, which showed that there was no benefit of one over the other in when used in acute severe asthma. Yet aminopalene is associated with much more side effects, especially one of them is persistent vomiting, the other being um, its cardiac side effects. But if you look, uh, obviously, uh, despite all this um, um, uh, side effects, when people are struggling with asthma, they will end up using the myelopardin. And a survey carried out in the uh, U.S. showed that 59, and it was a survey carried out among the intensive care personnel, and they said that 59% of them used a if they if uh, the other things were failing. But it should never be used as and if you have to use the choose between the two and then IV salbutamol is a much safer option. Um, this uh, we did never used it in UK, but the IM or subcut epinephrine or tributylene is used in uh, US. In US, IV salbutamol is not licensed, so if they have to use, they use IV tributylene. Now, um, if uh, uh, in ER, if uh, someone with very severe asthma walks in, you have no um, IV line, nothing, then it is uh, subcut or um, an IM epinephrine can be used. Um, tributylene is more beta 2 agonist at lower doses than epinephrine. Tributylene may cause, low, may lower the blood pressure. Epinephrine can increase cardiac output and raise blood pressure. And addition, epinephrine is also suitable for anaphylaxis, which can have a similar presentation to severe asthma attack. Um, whatever is readily available, you can use it. <clears throat> the doses, both doses of both have similar 0 0.05 milligram per kg. Um, of, um, uh, and uh, it's 0 0.01 ml per kg of a 1 milligram per ml solution. Maximum dose should be 0.4 milligrams. Uh, the doses should be repeated every 20 minutes for three doses unless significant side effects, for example, extreme hypertension, persistent amnesis develop. Most of the time, if patients are not responding to the you know, two doses of these, then they should be transferred to intravenous um, talbutamol or tributary. Now, we, we have had just, just discussed all the bronchodilators that we can possibly use for an excess exacerbation in children. Now we go to systemic corticoids. Systemic corticoids are also, again, a cornerstone of deep treatment of asthma exacerbation, whether it be mild, moderate, or severe. Now, any child with acute asthma exacerbation should receive steroid treatment as early as possible within one hour. This has been shown to reduce the risk of admission to hospitals, prevent relapse in symptoms after initial presentation. The anti-inflammatory action reduces airway edema and secretions. The effect, you have to understand, may not be noted for two to four hours of administration. So the, uh, the bronchodilators should be continued at all costs till the effect of glucocorticoid becomes apparent. Now, important thing to remember is that intravenous steroids are no more effective than oral steroids in moderate to severe asthma in children. And if the child is able to take orally, then uh, oral prednisolone is as effective as IV hydrocortisone and any steroid. <clears throat> the dose, 
Now, the steroids used in children for the treatment um, of acute asthma exacerbations are all these. So, prednisolone is the most commonly used. The dose is 1 to 2 milligrams per kg, maximum 60 milligrams per day, per first day, and then you would decrease half the dose for antibiotic for 3 to 5 days, maximum of 10 days, depending on how bad the asthma is and how bad it was to start with. Um, I mean, how, um, how much steroid inhaler the child is taking anyway to control chronic asthma. The other uh, the, um, oral um, 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 steroid is dexamethasone, and, uh, and the dose is 0.6 mg per kg. Um, it, was, it can be given by oral IM and IV. Hydrocortisone used only as IV, 4 mg per kg, 6 hourly. And methyl prednisolone, 1 to 2 mg per kg, maximum of 125 mg per day. And again, IV. Um, now, there's a meta-analysis which compared prednisolone with dexamethasone, and they found that a single dose of um, um, dexamethasone, single, I think, two doses of dexamethasone compared to the prednisolone given for three to five days, there was no, both of them had similar effects. So either one of them can be used. Uh, to date, the inhaled glucocorticoids, the use of inhaled glucocorticoids to treat children with acute asthma is an a, um, area of ongoing clinical research. The studies so far in children have shown mixed results. And the routine use of inhaled glucocorticoids in addition to or instead of systemic glucocorticoids in the management of acute asthma exacerbation in children is not yet recommended. Now, now these are the only medications possibly we can use in asthma exacerbations. Now we will just quickly go through algorithms so that you understand which, which medication to use when. So if we have a mild exacerbation, which we saw the uh, severity score, that is if you have a uh, index score of less than seven, or the child walks in, is, has no distress, normal SATs, but is easy, then is to give them inhaled uh, salbutamol with a meter dose inhaler with a spacer. Um, you keep assessing the child and you can repeat these doses every 20 to 30 minutes for a total of three doses. All these children should get an oral um, prednisolone um, if you see that the child has not improved with the first um, um, in, uh, dose of inhaler. Or if the, if the child was using steroid inhalers at home, then anyway you give them the first dose of uh, prednisolone. Uh, moderate exacerbations, now, obviously, you start with this. Uh, you start with the uh, nebulized albuterol and add intratropium bromide. You keep giving them every 20 to 30 minutes for three doses in one hour. And if you need them later, you you can increase this uh, space to 40, 30 to 45 minutes. You start systemic steroid, uh, steroids. Oral is suitable in most cases, and obviously uh, they if they would be needing oxygen. So ensure that the titrate the oxygen to maintain SATs si of more than 92. In severe exacerbations, do, you do the same. You give nebulized as salbutamol and ipratropium bromide. You give them intravenous glucocorticoids, and you give them IV magnesium sulfate. And if signs of impending respiratory failure start, then you um, speak with the PICU, um, start the admission to a PICU, the process of admission. Now, obviously, you reassess um, each of these, and if your acute exacerbation, if you had severe exacerbation, if you had severe exacerbation and you have given magnesium sulfate and the child is not improving, then the child should be started on IV salbutamol or tributylene and obviously shifted to a pediatric intensive care for further management. Mm -hmm. And if you have had moderate uh, exacerbations uh, which are not responding to your initial treatment, then ag again you start um, start magnesium sulfate and uh, as reassess and then you go to the others. And if they've responded well, uh, you can discharge them home. Um, the, if you discharge these children home, what should be the advice? The, uh, for if, so if for a child who's been having such frequent um, nebulizers in ER, should make, you should make sure that they go home and they just don't forget the beta, uh, the inhaler. Uh, the, so the, if the advice should be that they should continue salbutamol every four hours for the first three days and then wean over the next two to three days as tolerated. If the parents should be advised that they feel that they're needing these inhalers more frequently than four hours, then they should come back to the emergency department. 
Short course of oral corticosteroids, three to five days if they receive a dose of systemic steroids in the emergency department. Um, a follow up with a primary care or asthma specialist within a week. Um, I'll just skip these because I, I think we've discussed these. Um, and now I'll come to uh, the non standard therapies which are uh, available. I don't know if available in Pakistan, but available outside. Heliox, uh, Heliox is a mixture of helium and oxygen. Uh, it enhances beta agonist delivery because um, the lower gas density results in decreased flow resistance. Uh, the National Asthma Education Prevention Program um, uh, of um, um, America uh, guidelines, they have suggested administration of beta 2 agonists with Heliox in patients with life threatening exacerbation who are not responding to conventional treatment. The use of Heliox should not delay intubation once it is considered necessary. Heliox is not used if the patient requires greater than 40% oxygen because the beneficial effect of using low density gas is diminished as the oxygen fraction increases. Ketamine. Now, ketamine is the commonest, um, it is a, it's a bronchodilating agent. And when you have to anesthetize children with asthma, this is the agent which is used. But it is also being studied as a bronchodilator in non um, intubated children. Um, but one randomized control found that a, a study found that the ketamine was no better than the standard therapy in non-intubated children with acute CV asthma. Then leukotriene receptor and, um, antagonist. Um, Add-on therapy in acute um, asthma does not appear to provide additional benefit in children and added to standard therapy for acute asthma. Again, there was this trial um, done in 117 children aged 5 to 15 years treated in ED found no difference in the modified pulmonary index score between those treated with single age appropriate dose of Monte Lucas versus placebo. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation is also used in asthma, acute severe um, uh, or more life threatening um, uh, exacerbations. It eases the work of breathing in patients who are progressing towards respiratory failure, muscle fatigue. It helps to avoid endotracheal intubations um, uh, in select patients who continue to have severe uh, symptoms after intravenous bronchodilators or while awaiting the maximum therapeutic benefit of pharmacotherapy. To receive a non, um, a non invasive pro uh, positive pressure ventilation, it is important the child is awake and cooperative and have a patent airway and have spontaneous respirations. Um, evidence supporting the benefit of um, uh, non invasive uh, positive pressure ventilation in children with acute severe asthma is emerging, and so still more trials are needed. I'll just mention this briefly because uh, a lot of times and it's everywhere a knee jerk reaction to order an x ray in asthma. Actually, x ray helps very little in asthma, and it should only be done if we have. Uh, um, uh, this is indications are to if you want to rule out any AA leak pneumonia or atelectasis. So if you have a fever of more than 39 presence of focal air findings on examination, persistent tachypnea, hypoxemia, and chest pain, severe disease, and uncertainty about the diagnosis. Now, advice related to COVID-19. <clears throat> uh, the advice basically is that you continue the routine care. Whatever you use normally in children for asthma, you do the same. This includes prompt use of systemic glucocorticoids since delaying therapy is known to increase the risk of life threatening exacerbation. Now, the evidence of risk of infection spread by viral aerosolization through a nebulizer itself is unclear. The Public Health England essays that nebulization is not a viral droplet generating procedure. The droplets are from the machine and not from the patient. However, um, um, we know that under experimental conditions, the COVID virus um, remains in aerosol for up to three hours. And we don't know when we are using the nebulizer and the child is stuffing, whether that nebulizer is then dispersing it to the environment. So any child uh, presenting with asthma attack with saturations of less than 92% room air should be an administered nebulized bronchodilator as per the guidelines, whether and the personnel who are looking after the child should make sure that they are in pro proper PPE. And there should be low threshold for testing for COVID-19 in the asthma patients. And if the asthma patient is febrile, then you should test all of them. 